Thanks, Rich. Among other things, most of you may not know this, Rich almost didn't make it here today, and he's a real trooper. He's had a little health pitfall recently, but he's here, and this is, um, as he alluded to, it's been a labor of love. It, it's not a popular thing to be a contrary investor in most cases, as I've told people recently when it comes to things like Bitcoin uh, and, and Ethereum and doggy coin and cat coin and parrot coin and whatever other ones they come up with. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Uh, you, you know, if you go to a cocktail party these days until just the last week or two and, and, and confess that you're not involved in these cryptocurrencies, it's like, kind of like you just passed gas at church or something like that. I mean, it's not, it's not real popular. I mean, it would be like going to some lord's get-together in the Netherlands in about 1631 or two and saying, well, tulip bulbs? No, I don't own any of those. I haven't hocked my estate for tulip bulbs. What are you, nuts? And you'd kind of get laughed out of that room, too. Um, but we're, as, as I thought would happen, we've seen the end. Now, look, we, all of us would love to be able to borrow Doc Brown's DeLorean and go back a few years and buy a whole truckload of Bitcoin. That were skeptics of it, including me. All right, but we'll still get the last laugh. Anyway, a couple quick commercial messages before I get into my quick little diatribe here, and then Dr. Warren, as I promised before dinner, is going to get up and he's going to give you uh, some thoughts, and then we're going to do as we always do at Friday evening at these. Chicago Resource Expo related events. We're going to kind of open it up and just have fun. You want to talk, as I said earlier, about gold, uranium, lithium, the heartbreak of psoriasis. Uh, I'm not as first on the Cubs these days. I can't talk about that. But whatever you want to talk about, we'll do that. But the first commercial message is, if you've not seen Rich's wife Donna yet, to pay your tab for your share of dinner, make sure you do that. And secondly, Make sure that you get with me directly and know, especially if you're not already a subscriber right now to the National Investor, make sure that I have your name and email address because you're getting a comp trial subscription to the National Investor for being here. So in a way, I'm still kind of paying for your dinner, but I'm, I'm delighted to do that and delighted that you're here. Uh, very, very much so. and delighted that Rich and Donna and Eric made it as well. Uh, Eric is going to quickly become my right-hand man on a lot of different things because I've never been busier in my life than I've been in the last year or so. And uh, I, I can't do everything. And I need help with graphic stuff and things like that. So Eric's going to be my behind-the-scenes propagandist that makes me look good on the internet and stuff like that when I don't know my you know rear end from my elbow when it comes to how to do that stuff. So anyhow, with all that said and out of the way, what I want to talk about for just a few minutes, and particularly for those who are uh, watching this later on on YouTube or wherever they find it on the internet, is just give you some thoughts on where we're at right now with our economy. Because as always, whether it comes from those I call the Pied Pipers of the Gold Bug Echo Chamber, or those who have really never lived through the kind of changes that we're going through right now with the markets and the economy, there's a lot of misinformation out there right now. And I want to give you some of that. But first, let me back up and go back in history about 40 some odd years. I first, straight out of high school, got licensed to be in the financial planning industry. I was in the retail part of the financial planning business for a number of years got my insurance licenses and my A&H accident health licenses when I was 18 years old, got my securities license right after that, and I was an NASD general securities principal at the ripe old age of 20. And all of that was happening at a very, very pivotal time for the markets and for what today I call the inflation debate. You remember it back then, about 40 or so years ago. We had double-digit inflation. We had double-digit interest rates. We had some very smart people who were predicting that we were about in the United States of America to go the route of the so-called banana republics back in those days. In Central America and South America, we would have triple digit, quadruple digit inflation and interest rates 
because of the way in which our debt was starting to go up exponentially. You know, Jimmy Carter, who is one of the most unfairly maligned presidents in history, in my opinion, when it comes to economics, when he was in office, the national debt was $40 trillion, and he was an idiot. When Ronald Reagan became president, the national deficit, the annual deficit, increased by several times, and he was an economic genius, okay? When, and of course, Jimmy Carter had nothing to do with, with the high inflation and interest rates, which were first launched by Richard Nixon taking us off the gold standard and unleashing Arthur Burns on the world, who was his Fed chairman pick. Now, back in those days, with all of this going on, we had the dollar devalued through much of the 1970s. We had Jerry Ford's idea after he replaced the resigned Nixon of whipping inflation by giving us all buttons that said we're going to whip inflation. You remember all the whip, the win buttons that people wore back then? That's how we were going to do it. Okay, we had all of that going on. We had the national debt going up. We had the annual deficits going up, the dollar devaluing, and all the rest of this stuff. The national debt, when I first got in the business world as a financial planner, was approaching $1 trillion, double-digit double inflation, double-digit interest rates. And imagine, if you will, with me for just a moment, that you and I were having a conversation back then over a cocktail or a dinner, beautiful dinner, by the way, here at the Marriott tonight, thank you. We were visiting over dinner or drinks or whatnot. And I said to you, I got, I've got, you know, before there was even a Back to the Future movie, I, I've got this time machine. I said, Let me tell you something. As crazy as it might seem, I'll bet you in 40 years, yes, we'll still see an explosion in debt. Back at the time we were talking, it was $1 trillion approaching that level. What if I were to tell you that in 40 years, the national debt won't be one trillion, it won't be two, it won't be five, it won't be 10, it'll be approaching $30 trillion. And that's the part the government tells us about. It's not the many tens of trillions on top of that of unfunded liabilities and so forth, okay? But even though we're gonna have that explosion in debt, the reported inflation rate will crash to almost nothing. Interest rates, which back then were, were double digits, I remember putting people in the old Kemper money market fund, which for a while had a yield of over 20% for a money market fund. But interest rates will crash to nothing. People the world over will fight over putting money at a guaranteed loss, seemingly, into Uncle Sam's IOUs at half a percent, one percent, two percent. And this explosion in debt won't torpedo the economy. The economy will look wonderful. And the Dow Jones average, which when I was, we were having this conversation was around 1,000, will go to well over 30,000. Now, if I'd have told you 40 years ago all these things would have happened, you'd be on the phone to Happy Acres say, send a rubber truck for this guy. He's nuts. But what's happened? Exactly that. So, granted, the picture today is one that a lot of people 30, 40 years ago, myself included at various times, look, I read everything from Howard Ruff, I read everything from Doug Casey, I read everything from the gold bug guys, you know, um, but it didn't turn out the way they thought it would, or did it? Now, what I want to exp explain, and I've got several things about this still on my website, you can read, but we had a major change come into this country and our banking system and our markets and our economy during the reign of Paul Volcker. And it is not, not what you have commonly heard. Because what is the commonly heard legacy of Paul Volcker? That he crippled the inflation and run away uh, interest rates by jacking up interest rates and killing the inflation, strengthening the dollar, stopping all of the price rises and so forth to the late 70s and in, in, into the early 80s. Yeah, he did do all that. But later, he did a complete 180. 
And his legacy truly is that he was the first Fed chairman to preside over the complete upending of the banking and market and economic laws of the universe as we all knew them prior. Now, who remembers a fellow by the name of Harry Figge? Anybody? A couple of heads nodding. Rookie? Harry Figge was appointed to be one of the members of what was called at the time, when Ronald Reagan was first elected, the President's Private Sector Survey on Cost Control, more commonly known as the Grace Commission because the chairman was J. Peter Grace, who was the head of the conglomerate which bore his name. And Harry Figge, when he got on his commission, and I think Ronald Reagan was sincere you know, in, in setting this thing up and trying to eradicate waste and fraud in government and you know, save us from this abyss that it seemed like we were heading for economically, financially, fiscally in the U.S. of A. Harry Figge was so alarmed by what he saw that on his own and his corporation's own nickel, because he was a, had himself of Figge International, a Fortune 500 company back in those days, he put out pamphlets, he put out special supplements in his own corporation's annual report that showed this vertical spike of how you went inexorably higher and a little bit higher and then a little bit higher still in a debt level until you reach this critical mass and all of a sudden the debt spiked vertically. It had already done that in a lot of the banana republics of Central and South American nations and he said it's about to happen here. Harry Figge was not an idiot by any stretch of the imagination, but he as well as a lot of people back then and today are looking in the wrong place. Because the hyperinflation that Figge predicted indeed did happen. But thanks in part, in great part, to Paul Volcker and changing the nature of what the Federal Reserve was doing in the early 1980s. That hyperinflation was channeled as a first matter into asset prices. So yes, the annual deficits that were 40 billion or so under Carter were up to 200 and then 300 billion under Reagan and then Bush Sr. But when at the same time, the stock market had gone up to almost 3,000, by the summer of 1987 before that big crash, but it quickly recovered, and it's gone up tenfold since then, or better. And when real estate prices went up, the Fed said, hey, we figured out how we can extend this thing for a long time to come. And here again, this lesson, this epiphany that the Fed had was very much based on the experiences that they were having in Central and South America. Now, Philosophically, I've got a lot of very deeply held convictions as, as a Christian, as I won't say conservative because that's, not a, that's a, not a good term anymore, but as an American and someone who just loves our culture and our heritage, and I'm going to be up in northern Wisconsin in a few months for the birth of my 15th grandchild, and I want them to have a good life after, long after I'm gone. And so I, I look at these things and say, wait a minute, what, you know, how do, how do we define what's good, what's bad, how the economy works, and so forth? Well, let me get back, I'm going to lose my train of thought here, but let me get back to what happened back in Central and South America, because at the same time, I think extractive industries are important. I'm also an environmentalist. I don't think that extractive companies should have carte blanche to do whatever they want. I think there needs to be responsible mining, responsible extraction. All of us need to get into the subject of sustainability. So back in those days, when you had this major crisis in Central and South America, countries that couldn't pay their debts, they didn't have a Federal Reserve, they can't just print money, you know, create it out of thin air like the Fed does. For them, it's a direct cost. You have a direct consequence in inflation and then the currency markets rebel against you, you got high interest rates. So what happened back then? 
What happened was this. At the same time that a lot of these countries were buckling under collapsing currencies, triple-digit interest rates, and so forth, you had a lot of environmentalists back then who were dreadfully concerned over the health of the Amazon, over the health of a lot of other ecosystems in South America. Uh, I read a lot of things. I've still got things in my files on this about how a lot of what was being done was quite in a literal sense, we're, we're ripping out the lungs of the earth by leveling all of this rainforest land in South America. A lot of people never put two and two together and looked at this raising of a lot of beautiful jungle environment, rainforest environment, whatnot, in South America. And the advent back then under President Reagan of what were called Brady Bonds, named for his Treasury Secretary, Nicholas Brady. Now, Nicholas Brady was kind of an evil genius as a Treasury Secretary. And what he figured out is this. Now, I want you to think about this. This is a very simple concept. If you own land in one of the, you know, increasingly few, or de decreasingly few, how do you say that? Fewer areas around here that aren't developed, it's worth X per acre, right? But if you get a bulldozer and a couple of crews and go in there and you level it and you get power to it and whatnot, what happens to the value of that land? It goes up rather remarkably. And so what was happening was a lot of the reason why the rainforest was being leveled in parts of South America and other land that was just had never seen within miles and miles of it, any development was, was being ready for development, was not so much because people needed it, it was because the banking system needed it. And what happened was when a country, and let's say Brazil, for example, when land was worth just a few bucks a hectare, you know, remote, nothing there, when it was leveled, when power was brought in, when roads were brought in, when they got agri agribusiness in there or whatnot, the value of that land went up exponentially. And guess what was the basis for the Brady Bond loans to help bail out those countries? It was the value of that land. And by an accounting trick of the banks, when all of a sudden, by raising rainforests and developing land, they were able to say, oh, we can loan even more money to these nations, but now they got, quote, collateral on paper. Now the, now the game is okay because now this, this debt is not underwater, and now they can start servicing this debt again. So anything you see happen, don't ever forget that the be-all and end-all, whatever the policy is, is not for the benefit of people. It's always for the benefit of the banks. It's always for the benefit of keeping the system, the skyscraper, not house of cards, skyscraper of cards from imploding. So Paul Volcker took that lesson of the rainforest and whatnot and bailing out the Central American and South American nations from their debt problem and said, hey, we can do this too. So the more that they jacked the debt levels up and ran higher deficits and managed to feed that into asset prices, the more those high asset prices caused what we all have come to know in those years since is the wealth effect. If you look at your 401k balance, and gee, we're doing pretty good, you go out and buy a nicer house, you buy an extra car, you buy whatever. Because again, what has changed in the decades since our parents and grandparents were alive and were a lot more conservative and a lot more frugal was not our values as much as it was the system's need for us to be spendthrifts, to be over consumers, to live beyond our means. If they can keep enough balls in the air as far as asset prices so that we still go out and consume and run up our charge cards and so forth and keep this whole thing going. Now, it won't last forever. And in fact, as I've been saying recently, for those of you who follow me, this debate about inflation right now, 
where in the last several weeks we've seen CPI and PPI numbers higher than they've been in quite a few years, this is not the emergence of a new wave of inflation. This is an evidence that the hyperinflation of asset prices that has bled down because of all of this cheap money from the Fed is nearing another near-term end. And so I take the other side of the argument from a lot of people right now that are saying, oh, we're going to have hyperinflation, gold's going to go to 10000 an ounce, and all of the rest of this stuff. I don't know where you've been, but we've had hyperinflation in spades since at the end of the financial crisis in 2008, and the S&P 500 was that ominous number of 666. Now the S&P 500 has been, whatever it is, over 4,000. You know, the Dow recovered, the NASDAQ recovered, just about everything else did. Real estate's recovered in a different way. So we, we've got to that point, and yes, because of a lot of individual issues where you've got supply shortages, and therefore you're going to have higher prices for certain goods and services and commodities, we have by and large had a huge round of hyperinflation interrupted briefly and, and ominously last year when the pandemic started and everything crashed. You had that big air pocket. Everything went down for several weeks before the Fed caught it and started pushing it back up again. So I think as we get into later on, and in a minute, Dr. Warren's going to come up and give you some comments, and then he and I and Rich, and you know, we're going to be available, kind of field questions on you know, whatever topics you want to talk about, stocks, sectors, the economy, whatever. Um, one thing I want you to take away from this tonight is that, the, as, as often is the case, much of what you're hearing is not only superficial, but it's late. So my view is, in fact, as I've said with gold recently, I, I, I haven't warmed back up after twice last year to the day calling the peak in gold right before everything crashed last February and March, and then last summer when it was over 2,000 an ounce, and I told people to sell all of our trading positions and why gold is going to go down. I have turned back around bullish on gold again recently, but largely because I believe that it's going to benefit as everything else loses a lot of the air that's in it, whether you're talking stocks, copper, oil, land. People talked about lumber. Did you see what lumber's done in the last two weeks? It's dropped by a third in the last two weeks. You had this parabolic move in lumber, and boom, it was unsustainable. Everything is unsustainable. And it's unsustainable, and, and keep this this quick little mental picture in mind as we go through the evening. Let's say, and I'll talk to one of you, and each of you take this as an individual conversation. Let's say you and I were sitting down, just the two of us, over dinner tonight. And we had before dinner drinks, the after dinner drinks, you know, uh, big entree, dessert, the whole deal, and we're both, we're just stuffed. We can't even move. And at the end of the night, the waiter brings a check and says, here's your check, and the check's for $200. And we're looking at one another as, you know, who's going to step up and take the check, right? But before either one of us has a chance to actually grab the check from the waiter, the waiter says, wait, no, no not yet. Got a deal for you. Now, you two sit here, and the check's $200. You two sit here. And we're going to repeat the whole thing again from start to finish. New rounds of drinks before dinner, appetizers, another big, rich 10,000 calorie entree, dessert, and the whole deal. But we're only going to add $50 more to your check. But the chef doesn't want to throw this food away. I don't care if he takes $50 off of it. I don't care if he rips up the check and gives me the whole thing for free. I might do a Cass Elliott and croak if I stuff my face anymore that night, okay? And you need to understand that that is where the economy is. So when you hear, and there are exceptions to this. We'll talk about them later in the Q&A, mostly about uranium. Don't forget to ask me about that market. But look, we are at a point, no matter how much you hear about we're going to have this open-ended multi-year inflation, this, this big boom multi-year melt-up cyclical bull market in commodities, 
Let me ask you a question. When we now have many, many, many more trillions of dollars of debt in just the last year added to the equation because of the whole pandemic thing and the government trying to, quote, save us from it, and the Fed also, you don't distinguish, you know, you got to distinguish the Fed from the government, of course, as some of you know, you all should know. When you have that situation, and when you have a place where it's only because of all this free money that Joe Biden most recently, but it didn't start with him, has given out, the people sit home and buy their doggy coin and play on Robin Hood and go out and buy a few more baubles and doodads and things at the mall. But aside from that, you know, everybody's going back to a hand to mouth existence when that sugar high wears off. Who is going to bear the cost for copper at $10 a pound? For oil, if it goes back to $100 a barrel? For any of these things? Who is going to afford a Tesla or any other electric vehicle? If the price goes up by 50% in the next couple or three years because the raw materials continue to go up, who's going to pay for all that? When businesses and consumers alike are as stra strapped as they're going to get, and everybody feels like they're big shots, I mean, anybody can be a genius with borrowed money. But if we even go halfway back to a normal and sane and sober world, Who's going to bear those costs? So what I'm advising people in my newsletter is that the first things to get out of harm's way on are those corporations who cannot pass on the costs that are being passed on to them. I mean, one of my favorite, I'll give you one name right now, but I just recommended selling it. Ingalls Markets is my favorite grocer of all time. I've had people in and out of that stock for 20 years. And it'll go up two or three times in value, get to a point where I think it's kind of expensive or people don't care about it, sell it. Another downturn comes, you get back in. We've more than doubled our money on it this last go around, or about doubled our money on it. But the Ingalls Markets, which has had killer earnings in the last few quarters, as their costs go up for food and for fuel and for everything else, and they can't pass them on, what's going to happen to their earnings? They're going to start to go down again. So as an investor, as you're looking at your portfolio and decisions to make, you got to look for the weak links in there. What companies cannot pass on these costs? Even in the mining industry. And thankfully, and you're going to see a special report, again, a repeat of one I did last summer on the gold sector for me in the next few weeks. But even where gold is concerned, Costs are going up. Raw labor costs are going up as well, besides their costs for fuel and raw materials and things like that. So you've got to look at what companies are able to do well enough because of the strength of their properties or their management or whatnot to be able to shoulder those higher costs. So there's a lot of this is not going to be this easy rising tide lifts all boats things going forward just because the government and the Fed continue to print and or appropriate more and more money. We're about to the place again where instead of saying, oh, goody, more free money, the markets are going to say, oh, my God, more free money. And the average investor is not prepared for the shift back to, oh, my God, and that's what we'll hopefully get to the balance of the evening and later. And so that's all I'll say for right now is to put a few of those seeds in your head. And right now I want Dr. Lee Warren to come up who like the Redezes, because of the Redezes, I've known Lee and Penny for a good number of years now. He's one of the more interesting people I've ever met, and I'm always eager to hear what he has to say. And when Lee is done, we're both going to be on hand and, again, open it up for whatever thoughts are, and questions are on your mind. Lee?